Will you meet me in Daniel chapter 3 as we continue our series against the grain? We are seeing how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these young men, Jewish young men, how they went against the grain while they lived in exile under the empire of Babylon. Daniel 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the traps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Lord, when we face the fiery furnace... We need the wisdom and the courage that you supply. Enable us to see clearly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did and why they did what they did so that we might apply these things to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been tracking through the book of Daniel how God's people need to make small, hard, holy choices even while they live in the midst of empire and exile. We saw that back in chapter 1. Last week we saw how God is, he exercises sovereignty over all of human history. Even Nebuchadnezzar got this. We saw that at the end of chapter 2. So what in the world is Nebuchadnezzar thinking when we come to chapter 3? What is he doing? We're, we're on the heels of his proclamation there at the end of chapter 2, where he says that the God of Daniel, Daniel's God, is the God of gods. That's superlative language. If you got all the gods that were, are, and ever will be, got them all together, Daniel's God, Yahweh, in other words, 
would be God over all those gods. So what's Nebuchadnezzar doing? Well, he may be, I mean, we see this historically, other empires have done this. He may be trying to unite his kingdom under one religion, albeit misguided in his efforts. It's very possible that that dream that he's been reminded of and given the interpretation of, well, he, he took that literally and he thought, well, if I'm the head of gold, the head of gold's good, why not make the whole thing out of gold? And so he makes this massive 90 foot tall, because that's what 60 cubits translates to, is 90 feet for us, this nine story monstrosity of an image that has this, uh, uh, this it would have no doubt had a huge base in order to support that thing, and then it's uh, 90 cubits tall, and then the image itself is nine, uh, excuse me, 90 feet tall, and then the image itself is nine feet wide. And look, again, historically, we can identify how certain empires have done this. The Assyrian kings had a common practice of making images of themselves. And Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian, he's from that area, and Assyria was right before them, the empire before them. So it may have been that Nebuchadnezzar carried on that practice into his empire, and this is a representation of his dominion over the kingdom that he has. And uh, the image may represent the many gods of Babylon. Uh, one of them, if I remember correct, was Isbar, the god of fire. That seems to play a role here with this burning, fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is your god, the god that you serve, is he greater than Ishbar? Hmm. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar had in mind Yahweh. And so this may be his misguided efforts to try and honor the God of Daniel, maybe. Bottom line is, Nebuchadnezzar, it doesn't seem like he's really learned his lesson concerning idolatry, concerning pride. And so he's up to something. Probably to honor himself, maybe to honor the other gods of Babylon. Probability is low, but maybe to honor Yahweh. But he's using this idol to achieve his goal. And that's never a good way to pursue things. But he calls together, as we saw, verses 2 and 3, all of these government officials, all of the, the entire administration is called together and assembled. It's really impressive when you think about it. Probably a sea of government officials, thousands of these, uh, at these, these administrators over the empire Anyone who is anyone in the empire is there at the plain of Dura, uh, there in Babylon. Again, thousands of people, no doubt, gathered together for this dedication and for the follow-through, bowing down and worshiping and all that. But there are, are apparently some officials, the Chaldeans, they're singled out here. Some translations may say astrologers, these are wise men from Chaldea, Babylon. Apparently, some of these guys are jealous because Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, because of what Daniel did back in chapter 2, they've been promoted over certain provinces in Babylon. And apparently, there's some jealousy because we are told that they maliciously accused. Literally, the phrase there is they were, uh, it's, a, it's a cannibalistic phrase. They were eating them to pieces. Uh, they were just eaten up over this. And that's kind of a weak colloquial phrase in English to communicate what's really going on here. I mean, they were, it, it is, it is malicious. It is, they hate Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is anti-Semitism in, in all its grotesque deformity. And, and Daniel, conspicuously absent, we'll talk about why in just a moment, but uh, Daniel's not there, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are. And these Chaldeans, these wise men are taking it out. They are jealous they are resentful. And listen, jealousy and resentment, it's, these are ugly things. That's why God tells us to put this away. It's his conduct unbecoming of God's people. But these Chaldeans are not God's people. And so, uh, and, and we know this, the ugly head of jealousy, the grotesque figure of resentment, that hadn't gone away. It continues to rear its ugly head even today in many contexts. This is why, this is why, slander and gossip make their way through the workplace. 
That's why even there can be infighting among God's people in the church where it has no place at all. In this case, it brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face-to-face with possible death. And again, it's these three. Where's Daniel? Well, I think we're given the answer back in 249. Daniel remained at the king's court. He's, he's over in the king's court at the capital city there in Babylon. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are out. They've been appointed over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon. And it seems like since they're out among the kingdom, they have been invited along with uh, all the other government administrators to the plain of Dura. You just may say Valley of Dura, that's okay. It's just this is the place that this image would have been visible for miles. Just this flat area where everybody could see this image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And so they, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are present for this um, unveiling, this dedication service. And we see the cost, right? Bow down or you die. Verses 6 and 7 there. The temptation to conform must have been significant. The temptation to just go along to get along must have been very strong. Pressure to disobey the teaching of God's word, even with the threat of death. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are facing. In the whole sea of all these administrators bowing down before the image, there are three lone figures that are still standing. That's what the Chaldeans point out. They maliciously accuse the Jews generally, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as representatives of the Jewish people. And that's, that's what they do. O king, live forever. Typical way of addressing the king. You've made this decree, but there are these three who refuse to bow the knee. They refuse to bow down and uh, these certain Jewish individuals, because you have set up, you, you notice the, the phrase again and again, King Nebuchadnezzar set up, set up, set up. Mm-hmm. Emphasis is on him. He's the one who did it. Uh, and so, King, these three, they're not bowing the knee, and so you need to follow through with your decree and put them in the burning, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, when he hears this, verse 13, he has he furious rage overtakes him. He's upset. All right, he is, he's angry. And in his anger, he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're brought before him. And he asks them, is this true? But he, didn't get a, he doesn't wait for a reply. He says, look, here's the ultimatum. If you bow down, well and good. If you don't, you're going in the fiery furnace. And that's where we left off the reading. Let's pick it up in verse 16, shall we? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, there's some debate about the address here. They don't say, O king, live forever. They don't even address him as king. They just say, O Nebuchadnezzar. Right. Hmm. There may be something to that. Or maybe they just didn't think about it. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Who's gonna, what God is there? This is, the, this is the question, right? This is what the whole text turns on. What God is there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's going to save you from my hand? And they say, our God yes. will save us. He is able. He can do it. What they, they know that, that God is powerful enough He is able. He can deliver them. What they don't know is, will he? And that's what verse 18 is. But if not. And this is the martyr's confession. But if not. God is able. But if he doesn't. Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is civil disobedience as loyalty to Yahweh, the one true and only God. And the exclusive devotion 
that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have for Yahweh is rooted in their convictions that are based on the Word of God. The law specifically, Torah. And you know, that, so that lends itself to, okay, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow the knee. Why? Why did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow down? Because that's the thing, right? I mean, they, they could have debated it. You know what happens though when we start debating? If we haven't resolved in our hearts before the moment that we are going to obey God no matter what, chances are when you start debating the issue, Uh-oh. you're going to start wavering. Uh-oh. I think that's what would have happened. Okay. If they start debating the, the merits, the pros, the cons. I mean, think about it. I mean, uh, thousands of government officials. Do you really think all of them were honestly and sincerely worshiping <laughs> At the golden altar, it's like, well, all right, here he goes again, Nebuchadnezzar, all right, yeah, bow down, whatever. Just do the external thing, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can bow the knee. You don't have to mean it in your heart, right? No, they, they know, first of all. They know about the sovereignty of God. They know God is sovereign. They recognize that in their answer to Nebuchadnezzar and what they say. God is able. That's a, that's a declaration. He is able to deliver us. The God that we serve, he'll deliver us out of your hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they recognize the sovereignty of Yahweh. Not only in national affairs, chapter 2, but in the day-to-day, mundane, small, hard, holy choices that we have to make. They recognize he is able. The God who is sovereign in raising Nebuchadnezzar to power is able to deliver them from death. And here's the thing, Neb. God may have made you king, but he didn't make you God. All right, now. And, and they recognize actually God is sovereign. He is able Also, they recognize his sovereignty in their martyr's declaration. But if not, God can sovereignly choose to save us or he can sovereignly allow us to glorify him in a martyr's death. And either way, God is right and God is just in that. So they recognize, again, first of all, the sovereignty of God. But second, they know the scriptures. They know the scriptures. And this is Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6. Exodus 20, of course, is where we have the uh, Ten Commandments. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they know the the commandment that you shall not, you shall have no other gods before me. They know that you shall not make, verse 4, of Exodus 20, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for Yahweh, your God, I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they know the commandments. They know Torah. They know the law. And so as we already see, we've already seen this back in chapter one, they knew the kosher dietary regulations, but they also know the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and they knew we don't bow down. Even though we don't mean it in our heart, right? No, we, we don't Neither internally nor externally do we demonstrate any kind of loyalty to any other God, only Yahweh. So they know the scripture. Their convictions are rooted in scripture. They're rooted in their Bible. And then the third aspect, not only sovereignty in scripture, they have surrendered. They have surrendered themselves. And that's why there's no need to debate the merits, the pros, the cons. Can we, can't we? Uh, They are men of resolve. We saw this back in chapter 1, where Daniel resolved not to defile himself. And these men had first resolved not to devote themselves to any other God except Yahweh. They have devoted themselves exclusively 
to the God of the covenant. They are choosing loyalty to the covenant God and no other will take the place. And so this is what's fascinating. It is instant obedience. They, they, they don't even have to think about it. They, they answer and say to the king, first of all, we don't need to answer you. If God is able, he will. But if not, we're not bowing the knee. And so instant obedience that is rooted in their convictions. And it's such a familiar story, right? We know what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he loses his mind in verse 19. Filled with fury, the expression on his face changes against uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He orders the furnace heated seven times its normal heat. And uh, I came across... um, one writer was talking about how the, the temperatures in these furnaces, and it would have been like a uh, like one of those old-timey milk jug, right? Kind of that uh, bottle shape uh, kind of furnace. And they have discovered that these furnaces could have reached 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And so to heat it seven times, may just that may just be Nebuchadnezzar's way of saying, max it out. Right, we, if there's a if there's a thermometer on it, we want that mercury popping out the top. Right, that's how hot we want this uh, this furnace. Uh, he ordered some men in his army, bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, throw them in the furnace, and they were, and they're they're thrown in there with all their clothes. And in fact, the furnace was so overheated that the guys who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, they couldn't get away fast enough. They died throwing these three men in there. And they're, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fall bound into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, now it's his turn to, uh, to change his face again. And this time it's astonishment. His jaw hits the floor. Wah! And uh, verse 24, he was astonished, rose in haste. And he said, I thought we threw three guys in there. True, O king. How come I see four guys? And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And uh, he comes near to the door and he yells out, uh, Hey guys, servants of the Most High God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come on out. And uh, they do. They come walking out of the fire. And verse 27 says, Their hair wasn't singed. Uh, there wasn't any smell of smoke or fire on them. And, and again, Nebuchadnezzar is blown away by this. And he praises God. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Nebuchadnezzar recognizes the conviction and the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's a pagan king extolling the praises of Yahweh. Therefore, I make a decree. uh, You'll be torn limb from limb except you worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, There's no other God able to rescue anyone else, right? And, And then verse 30, here again, the favor of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are promoted in Babylon. So what does it mean for us today, right? Again, it's a familiar story. We tell it to the kids as as young as uh, uh, Cradle Roll and all that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And as I think about our situation with COVID, is there a parallel, first of all? Some people want to make that connection that, well, we we need to engage in civil disobedience or maybe Well, why didn't we engage in civil disobedience these six, seven months we've been under global pandemic, right? Especially here in California, where the governor has shut down worship gatherings and things like that. And yeah, we reopened back in June, but then we had to shut back down. And so, so, you know, our our worship gatherings have been shut down partly because the governor has issued the order, the shutdown order, his decree, if you will. So why did we submit to that? Our submission, hear me on this, our submission to the shutdown order was due to the concern of spreading the virus. 
in order to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, in order to love one another with the kind of love that Christ has for us, lest we infect those that we love, we willingly submitted to the order. That's why we shut down. And so, you know, we might think, well, I'm okay sacrificing myself so as long as I can worship God. We would not want to harm our siblings. We would not want to harm our neighbors. God forbid. We are not loving our neighbor if we are communicating COVID to them, right? And so therefore, I think there's a difference It's not a one-to-one parallel between what we're experiencing today and what Daniel, excuse me, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced here in Daniel 3. Okay, Nick, I'll go along with that. What would a comparable contemporary example look like then? Great question. I think it's very simple. Remove COVID. If you remove the coronavirus... Uh, If there's no global pandemic, if there's no communicable disease, and the governor or the mayor or the president or Congress were to issue a cease and desist order for worship gatherings, I think we get close. We're a bit closer to what Daniel 3 is describing here, a, a situation that's comparable to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think that's the difference. But here's really what I want to emphasize. God is worth dying for. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew Yahweh is worth dying for. But if not, again, that's the martyr's confession. Even if God does not deliver me, does not deliver us from death, our God is still worth dying for. Approximately 600 years later, Jesus is walking the planet, and he communicates, he teaches us the same thing, that he is worth dying for. Uh, This is Luke 9, there are parallels to this all over the Gospels, but Luke 9, 23. He said to all, this is Jesus talking to anyone who would come after him, if anyone would follow me, come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. This is an invitation to self-sacrificing death. Where you die daily so that Christ can live in you. Verse 24, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Do you hear what he's saying? I'm worth dying for. Jesus is saying that he is worth dying for. He is worth the daily self-sacrifice. He is worth you laying down your life daily on the altar of the cross so that you can live for him. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses or forfeits himself? In other words, what would you give If you gain the whole world, but you lost your soul, what would you give to get it back? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory and the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And again, what he's saying is self-death, daily self-death is the price you pay to follow Christ. God the Son shows us what a life worth living looks like. It is a life given fully to Him. Living for God, this is the greatest thing in the world. Living for Christ is the greatest thing in the world, even if we have to die for it. When Christ was in the fiery crucible of the cross, there was no deliverance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get pulled out of the fiery furnace. And we could talk about how when God's people experience trials, experience their own fiery furnace, that our Father, He has His hand on the thermostat and His eye on the clock. But when it came to the Son, God the Son, 
when he is in the fiery crucible of the cross, hanging there, he is doing what no other human could possibly do. He endured ignoble death. He was not pulled out of his fiery furnace. He endured it to the uttermost. But through the cross and through his death, the Son shows us that beyond death is eternal life. Real, eternal life. Even if we have to die, we know that beyond death is our God. Beyond death is our Father. Beyond death is resurrection from the dead. And here is why God is worth dying for. He promises eternal life. Jesus in John eleven twenty five 25 says, Even though he die, yet will he live. Do you believe this? Father, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to see that there is nothing on earth that is worth more than you. That you truly are worth our everything. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.